ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very happy um, to welcome you all to this evening's public lecture. I'm the director of the Australian Archaeological Institute at Athens, and my name is Stavros Paspalos. This is a truly international event, given the fact that our speaker is in Rome. I, of course, um, am still in Sydney, in Australia, and I'm sure that many of the attendees are at various spots around our globe. Before introducing our speaker, I would like to inform everybody that the lecture will be recorded and that there will be opportunity to ask questions after the lecture. And for anybody wanting to do so, I would ask you uh, to type your questions into the chat facility and then um, I will read them out um, to Emlyn um, during the question time. Our speaker, Emlyn Dodd, has very recently taken up his new post as Assistant Director for Archaeology at the British School at Rome. He was educated at Macquarie University here in Sydney, where he received his doctorate in 2018 with his thesis on Roman and late antique wine production in the Eastern Mediterranean, a comparative archaeological study at Antioch at Kragum, Turkey and Delos, Greece. Since that time, he has held a number of fellowships and affiliate as well as teaching positions, including, at, including our institute's Athens Fellowship in 2019-2020. A recipient of numerous grants and awards, his research interests focus primarily on ancient agricultural methods and technology, especially as they relate to viticulture and earlier culture in the Eastern and Central Mediterranean, trade in the ancient economy and maritime archaeology. And these are just a few of his interests. He has undertaken field work and research projects in Greece, Turkey, Italy, and Tunisia. Most recently, he has worked in the Cyclades, and we hope that he will soon return. Emlyn actively publishes the results of his research, and last year released his first monograph entitled Roman and Late Antique Wine Production in the Eastern Mediterranean. So, as you can see, Emlyn is the right person to speak to us on the subject of ancient agricultural practices this evening in his lecture, Wine and the Vine, a walk through the beginnings, middle, and end of ancient Greek viticulture. So, Emlyn, I'll ask you to share your, your screen. Okay. I hope everyone can see that. And, and thank you, Stavros, for, for such a, a beautiful and, and well-rounded introduction. Um, incredibly kind. Um, I do apologize for, as I mentioned to Stavros earlier, the, the internet here has been a little bit temperamental. So please bear with me if, if it does cut in and out. I'm sure it will return. Um, but, but of course, I'm here today to talk about uh, uh, ancient Greek viticulture and wine, um, predominantly because it's one of my, my main research interests, um, but also because uh, I think it's something that, that has a great deal of public interest um, and something we can uh, all relate to um, uh, in one respect or another. So wine, uh, as many of us know, was, was a key fork of the, of the Mediterranean triad uh, among oil and grain. Uh, and it was one of the most profitable cash crops of antiquity. Wine was embedded within ancient cultures of the, the ancient Mediterranean and other regions for thousands of years. Uh, we have records of it drunk by the richest and the, the poorest of society. Uh, we, we hear of Julius Caesar, for example, serving up a 60-year-old Falernian wine at one of his celebratory banquets, uh, which was apparently the best vintage in all of Roman history. Uh, and we also get accounts uh, on the other end of the scale, like that of Macrobius, who, who describes a mingled crowd of slaves and peasants drinking the must as it was pressed from the grapes. Um, so it's stretched across social strata. Uh, and recent work has also begun to suggest that wine, along with other commodities like oil, uh, was central to the social organisation of Mediterranean communities. Uh, and indeed, these commodities possess massive potential for investigating connections between agriculture, uh, the economy, society, religion, uh, and many, many other aspects of the ancient world. Wine drinking itself has often been associated with the emergence of elites, where it has played an important role in the, the hospitality uh, and feasting of these communities. Uh, but while growing vines and making and selling wine could be incredibly profitable, it was also uh, a very intensive and often risky uh, venture in antiquity. Vines uh, themselves are quite demanding. They require year-round monitoring. They require pest and disease control, fertilisation, uh, often irrigation, uh, though this did vary across the Mediterranean. Uh, and they often require a, a very detailed and specialised knowledge, uh, uh, in, including making informed decisions regarding the harvest and pruning. 
They're an inherent investment. They require at least three years of careful nurturing before you can actually get any usable fruit from the vine. And it's a combination of all these characteristics uh, that really start to contribute towards um, things like tying people down to the land, uh, as well as controlling land through power structures um, due to immovable crops. So where will we uh, explore today in this um, public lecture? Well, I'm gonna start with the beginnings of viticulture, not just in Greece, but also further to the east, uh, at the end of the Paleolithic and early Neolithic periods, uh, where the vine was supposedly domesticated and our first clues of winemaking appear. Then I will work uh, through the classical Hellenistic and Roman periods, where we see some changes in knowledge, scale and purpose, uh, as well as our first indications of a real uh, wine culture and organised wine industry. And we'll finish up in late antiquity uh, and the Byzantine era to see what happened to ancient Greek viniculture, whether sharp changes of this period caused stagnation or, or whether they continued in practice uh, and, and the kind of dramatic changes didn't contribute as much. In terms of locations, as I said, um, we will start slightly further to the east, but rather obviously what follows will focus for the most part on Greece uh, and the Greek lands in antiquity. Um, but the, the Greek world obviously uh, was interconnected through, through the whole Eastern Mediterranean and the broader Mediterranean throughout um, prehistory and history. Um, so at times there will be evidence brought in from elsewhere because it does contribute to our understanding of what was happening uh, in the Greek region during antiquity. So where do we start? Well, the origins uh, of the vine and wine um, are thought to traditionally have begun in um, the Near Eastern region uh, around the temperate zones of Asia, Europe and uh, North America where, where wild vines grew. Um, but interestingly, uh, of around 100 species uh, of wild grape vines, only one of these, uh, a Eurasian grape species, Vitis vinifera sylvestris, is the source of 99% of the world's wine today. So this one species, Vitis vinifera sylvestris, gives us everything ranging from Shiraz to Gertz Tramina to your local uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, it can be a dense red color to a flinty white grape. Um, and we owe a seemingly infinite a range of colors, uh, sweetness, acidic bodies, aromas, everything you can imagine in wine to this one grape species. And you can see here some images of this wild vine growing uh, as it once did all across the Mediterranean, but um, is in fact quite rare to see uh, in the Mediterranean today growing wild. In terms of history, we, we obviously have many myths and legends telling us about the origins of grapes and wine. Uh, we've got ancient Greek writers passing down stories of Dionysus, the, the god of wine, uh, originating in Phoenicia, Crete, Thrace, uh, Lydia and Phrygia. Uh, we've got other stories telling us that the vine sprang from the blood of humans who fought against the gods. And then if we look slightly further to the east, there's the Persian tale of King Jamshid, uh, who was fond of fresh grapes, uh, stored them in jars to have a year round supply. Um, but when one jar supposedly went bad and was actually dr accidentally drunk by a harem consort, uh, who then fell into a deep sleep, they realised that the creation of fermented grape juice was not poison, uh, and they in fact ordered more to be made. So there's a range of stories um, that tell us about the, these origin myths, um, but of course, such stories and interpretation must be treated with great caution uh, and elements of truth are few and far between. The primary scientific hypothesis is that uh, domestication for the grapevine took place in the regions between the Fertile Crescent and the Caucasus, uh, between 6,000 to 3,000 BCE, where the first indications of winemaking have also been discovered. Uh, and you can see the extent of uh, modern wild grapevine on, on the map and some key locations where archaeological um, and archaeobotanical evidence has been found. The traditionally accepted theory is that the earliest wine first appears uh, in a similar region around here, perhaps due to accidental or experimental um, late Paleolithic human activity uh, around the modern regions of Georgia, Iran and Eastern Turkey. It's then thought that the uh, grapevine spread into uh, Egypt and lower Mesopotamia around three and a half thousand and three thousand BCE, then across to Crete, 2200 BCE and westwards further into the Mediterranean through Italy, uh, North Africa and into France and Spain. Now this is very interesting and, and has actually been um, subject to, to somewhat uh, discussion and debate. Um, and recent evidence is contributing to some new theories which, which are supported by quite a bit of archeological and archeobotanical evidence. Um, 
essentially these, this new evidence is suggesting that there could have been in fact a number of parallel domestication events uh, and wine producing experiments uh, and, and evidence is starting to stack up in regions of Greece and Italy um, where there's possibilities of parallel um, experimenting and domestication happening at the same time or, or slightly the same time as the evidence in the, uh, further to the east. But if we look where the most sound archaeological evidence is um, traditionally, uh, one of the best examples is this site in Georgia called Gora, uh, where wine was obviously being produced on a relatively large scale around the year 6000 BCE. Uh, this is indicated by residue analysis on ceramic jars, uh, as you can see down the bottom right, which are also decorated with reliefs of grapes um, and furthered by pollen analysis for, from the settlement itself, where the soil showed grapevines once dominating the hillsides surrounding. Another example slightly later is the uh, Arani 1 cave system in Armenia uh, around the year 4000 BCE, where systems of large jars and vats for treading grapes, uh, along with fermentation and drinking vessels, uh, and archaeobotanical evidence of grape skins, uh, vines and seeds were also found. Uh, scientific testing also confirmed uh, in this residue the presence of Malvadin, which is a very, very common component of red wine. The cool and steady temperatures of these caves, uh, as we see in later Hellenistic and Roman periods in the Near East, are perfect for fermentation and storage. So it makes complete sense um, that early winemaking was occurring in these kind of environments. And these dates uh, in the, the early Neolithic period coincide quite nicely with, with times when humans were starting to establish more sedentary communities uh, and settlements, um, something which is almost a necessity when you consider the investment, uh, the labour and the care that's required in cultivating vines, not just using wild vines, uh, as well as things like creating large pottery vessels and making wine. It's not easily done on a very nomadic basis. But if we turn our uh, attention to Greece, what was happening here and what is the evidence here for early winemaking? As I mentioned, uh, there are starting to be some alternative theories popping up regarding parallel domestication events uh, at other locations where wild grapevines thrived. Uh, and these are starting to gain some real traction through recent archeological work in the last 10 to 20 years. The first pieces of evidence in Greece, um, you can see plotted across these maps. Uh, the wild grapevine, of course, grew across the Mediterranean uh, and pollen records for Greece indicate that it was present from the early Pleistocene and early Holocene eras, anywhere from 12,000 to a few million years ago. So we know that there was wild grapevine here and people could have been using it in very, very early um, periods of human activity. But we've traditionally thought that, that um, arboriculture and viticulture in Greece was strongly linked to the emergence of palatial civilizations um, like we have in Greece, uh, across the Peloponnese, due the, uh, in the Bronze Age. However, seed and, and fruit remains are starting to show that grape was consumed from the early Neolithic, from 7000 BCE, uh, particularly in the Peloponnese and up in Thessaly. Uh, and we also have vine management, uh, evidence of vine management in northern Greece as early as the 5th millennium BC, uh, well before the emergence of these so-called palatial cultures. We are also starting to see slightly later some evidence of winemaking in particular in the Aegean as early as the late Neolithic. Uh, and some of this comes from sites like Viklitash and Macri up in northern Greece, you can see on the map, um, where wild grapevines uh, were likely cultivated. But uh, very important to note, they were not domesticated, it seems. Uh, cultivation, of course, is vine management, uh, things like pruning and planting for fruit production, um, but not specifically uh, domesticating. Grape pips and vine charcoal around these early sites in northern Greece um, were discovered in the same contexts. And this joint discovery of seeds and charcoal uh, is starting to paint a, a clearer picture of cultivation uh, and also maybe evidence of wood provided by pruning. We also suspect that they started to make wine here. Uh, we've got large concentrations of pips and pressed grape skins and pressed grape um, fragments, uh, along with tartaric and malic acids present, present on potsherds, uh, obviously key indicators of wine through scientific testing. But these berries that they were picking, uh, even if they were cultivated, would likely have been very, very small and the wine of a very low quality. Fermentation would have been very haphazard uh, and high alcoholic content is quite difficult to reach. We do start to see uh, later on, uh, around the Middle Bronze Age, 1900 to 1700 BC, um, shifts from wild to domesticated vines. And we see this most clearly through uh, looking at grape pips and the remnants of grape pips through uh, a study called morphometrics. 
This is, this is also subject to debate. Uh, we've got some excellent people uh, even in Australia like Anne Dighton working on these kind of things. So hopefully uh, in following years we'll see more clarity on this. Uh, but it is possible that, that from this Middle Bronze Age and, and definitely by the Late Bronze Age, domesticated grapes and vines started to dominate uh, assemblages in the archaeology. Now these early seeds ha have close similarities um, through DNA testing to modern varieties from Greece, but also from uh, areas like the Balkans, the Caucasus and even Southwest Asia. So it's possible that the that cultivars from the Eastern Mediterranean uh, were, were being uh, prioritised, but it's also possible that the early stages of local domestication and diversification were bringing in vines from other uh, Mediterranean regions um, to cross cultivate and, and start to domesticate. Some of these sites like Dikli Kesh uh, can be considered very closely related to modern varieties like the Greek Heptaculo uh, and the Turkish Glicostaphylo. Other similarities can be seen to vines in regions um, that we might not suspect uh, as obviously, like Azerbaijan, uh, Bulgaria, Cyprus, Georgia, and even as far, as far afield as Russia. So there's some really interesting maps starting to appear uh, of relationships between early grapes uh, and early winemaking and where people were bringing these in uh, and creating um, vines and wines. So it seems quite clear now through, through recent archaeological evidence that vines were certainly cultivated uh, and probably domesticated centuries before the beginnings of these Mycenaean and Minoan uh, palatial cultures. When we do get to this late Bronze Age period uh, and these palatial cultures, we start to see very clear evidence of a significant role of wine in the, in the cultural, uh, socio-cultural life. Uh, exploitation of marginal land as well, importantly, favoured the development of viticulture. The first written evidence of cultivated winemaking, uh, cultivated grapevines, sorry, comes from this period uh, on Linear B, uh, uh, tablets from Nosos and Pylos that mention the grapevine specifically uh, and things like fig trees. Uh, interestingly, the word used to describe the wine on these tablets um, sometimes, which is uh, wedgewi, means married. Uh, and this could possibly be used to describe the method of training vines up trees uh, in an orchard. And, and we know that the Romans did this much later. So there's a possible origin here of training vines up trees and a preference of cultivation method. The new economic and social role of wine combined with palatial control of production uh, might have forced a revolution in new cultivation practices, uh, as well as the selection of new vine types that were better for winemaking. So we still see real uh, increasing evidence here for domestication of the vine. And also uh, coinciding with uh, intensification of exchange, networking and communication between Greece, uh, the Aegean and the surrounding regions, uh, regions from um, 1600 BC onwards. And all of this, uh, of course, led to a diverse range of cultivated and wild vine types used from the late Bronze Age uh, into the archaic eras. Now, according to uh, some scholars like Palmer, wine was a, a rare commodity. It was a luxury liquid at this time in the late Bronze Age, uh, produced in different areas controlled by palaces, which then redistributed it um, mainly on special occasions to people of high status or to sanctuaries, um, predominantly for religious and cultural purposes. And of course, artifacts that we do have indicate collective consumption of food and drink, uh, including wine, we think, um, including things like feasting and storage of drinking cups to be used on special occasions. And some fantastic examples of this uh, on the screen. Now, while this is likely, wine can also be produced with relatively simple methods. Uh, and such processes have very low archeological survival rates and are very difficult to recognize. And I think it's quite likely that these have been historically underappreciated. It's incredibly, uh, increasingly possible that wine was consumed more broadly across communities, uh, even in these early eras, uh, produced on small local or domestic scales uh, for things like household consumption. Some of the, the, the most obvious evidence of this comes from the, the very famous sites uh, of these palatial cultures, uh, Mycenaean culture. We have the Palace of Nestor here uh, near Pylos, which has a room with 25 pithoi, uh, holes for at least 10 more. So it's a quite large storage facility, um, possibly for wine, uh, as indicated by ideograms on inscribed clay pellets also found in this room. And the immense scale of these pithoi um, really do start to indicate, if it was for wine, the, the scale of um, production and consumption that was occurring. Uh, and this starts to agree with other evidence from sites like Tiryns and Sparta, which also have um, jar seals with the impression of vine leaves on them. 
down on Crete uh, at Minoan sites, we've got press equipment um, closely related to palaces and villas. Um, some fantastic evidence from sites like Monastiraki on Crete, uh, where we see treading vats um, flowing into collection containers, and then also uh, evidence of large scale production and consumption um, with many, many pithoi um, storing what was likely wine. And if we move to the islands, uh, the Cyclades, uh, at, ancient, at ancient Thera on Santorini, uh, we have images of vines and grapes on painted ceramics, perhaps suggesting some sort of use and early production there too. So you can start to see um, some really nice evidence building up in these early uh, and um, late Bronze Age uh, cultures. Now, moving slightly further ahead um, to the middle of our discussion today, into the classical and through the Hellenistic and Roman periods. What changed uh, in terms of scale uh, and production? Well, in the earlier classical periods, um, the archaeological evidence starts to reveal overwhelming use of domesticated vines for, for wine production. But very interesting, uh, scientific analysis has also recognised some minor use of wild types. So it seems to me that people were still using what was available to them, whether it was domesticated vines uh, for the most part, but also if wild vines were available. And this was perhaps linked to their uh, socioeconomic status, their, their knowledge or their geographical location. But what really changed in this period, uh, especially with the shift from Bronze to Iron Age? Uh, well, really, not a huge amount. There were obviously increases and changes to organisation, uh, shifts towards larger scale uh, export production, uh, perhaps more than local, uh, and also some new technologies introduced to press grapes, namely things like the screw press uh, and screw technology. But this didn't, in fact, um, become popularised uh, in Greece in particular uh, until late antiquity, uh, the screw press, uh, that is. And it also didn't really in, uh, always or necessarily increase efficiency. Uh, often these technological innovations were uh, focused on creating different types of production uh, for different contexts uh, in particular, or sometimes used to help aspects of safety. Uh, we think that the screw press uh, was, was a safer method uh, and more reliable method of production than these large lever presses that we start seeing popping up, uh, particularly in the Roman period. Compared to somewhere like Imperial Italy, we don't really have much evidence of Greece embracing immense slave-run villa production. We see huge slave estates on sites like it in sites in Italy. Um, in Greece, it appears to have been, uh, particularly in the classical and Hellenistic eras, slightly smaller scale and more dispersed across the countryside. Uh, certainly uh, in the classical and Hellenistic eras, as I said, and possibly also continuing into the Roman era. There are, of course, a, a few scattered literary references to larger estates uh, in some of the more famous wine producing regions like Thasos, where we, where we see vineyards of eight, 10, and even up to 30 hectares in the, in the late fifth century BC, um, and even one of 12 hectares uh, in Attica. Uh, slightly later. Uh, and intriguingly, uh, and some beautiful uh, archaeological work uh, recently, has revealed um, some sizable systematic viticulture in the classical and Hellenistic Greek world. Um, and of course, more research will, will undoubtedly reveal uh, more of this as our, our methods improve. Uh, but at this site, which is up in the Crimean Peninsula, uh, two sites called Ortli and Mai Mai Jup have revealed traces of vineyards from around 300 BCE. And these vineyards are actually accompanied by large farm buildings uh, and at the site of Ortley in, in particular, an attached tower and quite a range of artifacts that were destroyed uh, in what seems to be a fire. Now it's quite interesting at these sites, uh, you can see mapped here, um, the geophysics outlined. Uh, we have the, the farmyard and tower over here and, and what appears to be a large vineyard. It's quite interesting to note that they bear very unusual regional characteristics that we don't see uh, commonly across Greece. The vines seem to be, uh, seem to be grown uh, in small um, stone rows. We, we can see here excavation ground truthing, what appears to be a small stone wall um, mapped on the geophysics. And, and this is what was picked up in the magnetrometry and isn't really seen um, as often uh, across the rest of Greece. 
despite these um, these occurrences, a few uh, mentions in the literature and what is starting to be revealed through the archaeology, the majority of viticulture and winemaking uh, was most likely uh, on a smaller scale across peasant land holdings, uh, embedded into the common polycultural cycle uh, across classical Hellenistic uh, and even later Greece, uh, alongside things like grains, olives and orchards. We don't start to see, uh, we don't see much um, large scale monoculture, even in these later eras. So what were they making uh, at these vineyards through the classical Hellenistic and Roman period? Um, well, what did change was an ever increasing, ever increasing variety of wine types uh, and flavours. Uh, in modern Greece, uh, approximately 70% of annual wine production is of white wine. Uh, and the situation would not have been uh, reflected in antiquity. We think it was uh, much more variable. White wine is in fact a much more difficult product to create, uh, requiring more specialist knowledge and awareness um, than darker varieties of wine. It's much more probable in antiquity that a range of dark red, rosé, orange and white wines were present, uh, a, a variable um, array of colours dependent on the skill of the producer, um, the use of the wine, uh, as well as the market that was desired. In the Bronze Age, uh, we see um, passed down through Homeric Epic as well, mixed alcoholic beverages, which, which may have even been more popular than just straight wine. Uh, similar to the, the, the Kikion uh, of Homer, these were made from Pramnian wine, perhaps uh, a sweet dark wine, uh, and then had honey and barley and, and cheese mixed through them. Uh, and people have recreated these wines and come up with some quite interesting end results. And these, um, these mixed wines may have even been transferred across to Italy because we see some archaeological evidence suggesting uh, the production of these wines uh, in particularly the southern regions of Italy uh, through Greek colonisation. Now Hesiod uh, in the 8th century BC also passes down some instructions to make a very sweet type of wine called passum or passito uh, from sun-dried and raisined grapes. Uh, you can see here images of this uh, almost identical production method continued uh, into the modern era across regions of France and Italy and Greece itself, especially on the island of Santorini. Um, fantastic types of very sweet wine made through these processes. So there was certainly a, a great degree of variety uh, within the classical Hellenistic and Roman eras. Um, and we even start to see uh, things like additives added into the wine for a variety of reasons. In the Greek world in particular, this included improving flavour by adding resin, uh, especially imparted from lining the jars in pitch, as you can see there on the right, an amphora completely lined in pitch uh, to be waterproof, and this obviously started to affect the flavour of the wine within the, the amphora. We also see things like uh, aromatic herbs, spices, uh, and seawater, which seems to have picked up in popularity from the 4th BCE, uh, particularly in regions like Kos, uh, alongside other additives like brine, oil and perfume added into the wine to, to, to vary the flavour uh, and also to start um, aiming to preserve the wine to a greater extent. And a fantastic parallel of this, uh, the most obvious parallel in, in modern uh, times is undoubtedly um, Greek retsina, um, very, very clearly paralleled to the ancient practice of adding uh, resin. Now, much of this, as I, as I said, was done to try and uh, affect the flavour of the wine, but also done to try and control wines and limit things like oxidisation, which was very, very difficult uh, in antiquity before modern stabilising developments like adding sulphur came in. Um, despite this, wine in antiquity would have spoiled quite easily, uh, especially if it was relatively high in alcohol. It would have had a low acidity, uh, a very high pH level, and could have tasted quite horrible. So it was uh, somewhat uh, involved somewhat skill to, to actually get your wine right in antiquity. It also means that it's quite likely the vast majority of wines in antiquity were drunk within the year. Only the highest quality uh, and the most expensive would have been suitable for aging uh, and of retaining their quality beyond a year or two. And we start to see reflections of this uh, in the literature, perhaps emphasised in the quote from the fourth century uh, Greek comedic poets Eubulus and Alexis, who say that women liked old wines but young men. We also see reflections perhaps in Hippocrates, uh, who specifically states that wines from Thasos, uh, Chios, Lesbos and Mende were capable of ageing. 
and the archaeological evidence provides insight here, like the El Sec shipwreck from the 4th century BCE, which has a selection of Mendean amphorae on board, all thought to be around 20 to 40 years old when the ship sank. Uh, and you can see uh, a Mendean amphora on the left there. Um, Similarly, it's quite clear that, that the wine uh, in antiquity would have been uh, a moderate to low in alcohol. Um, for the most part, there would have been some more alcoholic wines, uh, but this would have required uh, very, very specialised skills, uh, significantly more knowledge than, than just producing your average wine in antiquity. Um, and achieving levels above something like 14% alcohol would have been very difficult uh, using only wild yeasts and, and natural production methods. We also know that even by the 4th century BCE, uh, there was uh, an in, in a quite impressive scientific uh, level of awareness for the impact of things like soil type on wine, uh, and that certain vine types were suitable for certain climates uh, and certain soils. Uh, we see this through authors like Theophrastus. And this was only set to increase through the Roman eras, uh, with increasing awareness and scientific knowledge of environment and agriculture, um, starting to be evidenced by, by authors like Pliny and Columella and Palladius and so on. So what did these people like to drink? Um, did they have particular preference of wines and was there a kind of wine hierarchy? Uh, well, the, the general answer is yes. Um, there was certainly a, an idea of good and bad wine as we have today, um, but it wasn't really tied in antiquity to specific uh, winemakers or, or vintners, rather it was tied to specific re uh, regions. In the late classical and early Hellenistic era, one of the most expensive wines um, sold in the Athenian Agora, for example, was from Chios. So there was clearly some degree of wine connoisseurship apparently uh, in Athens at the time. Uh, we have the poets also singing praises and showing disapproval of various wine types. Um, other uh, highly regarded regions um, that we see through the archaeology uh, included regions like the um, Mende, uh, Kos, Lesbos, Naxos and Thesos, uh, among other regions. So a real spread of regions across the, the Eastern Mediterranean, but, but particularly focused on some of the islands. Now, some of these regions uh, also have their, their wine culture reflected in other evidence, like, like the, the numismatics, the coins of these islands. Uh, we start to see many, many representations of Dionysus, of grapes and vines appearing on the coins, uh, furthering um, their kind of, or cementing their recognition that they were, they were worthy producers of wine and the vine. Other evidence like that from Thesos, um, shows that they had increasing systematic complexity uh, in their wine culture and their wine production. And they in fact went to great lengths to regulate and control their wine economy. Uh, here on Thesos, uh, amphora were required to be of standard sizes uh, and were sealed with the name of an annual magistrate to guarantee their authenticity. Uh, the island also banned citizens from importing foreign wines. Uh, and all of this started to uh, combine and protect the reputation and value of Thasian wine itself. And through this, we start to see similarities, in my opinion, uh, at least to modern hype culture, where we see small quantities of wine made and sold for a premium, really starting to play on the idea that people want what they can't have and that they want what there simply isn't much of. Uh, the excitement and the adrenaline uh, to elites uh, of possessing rarity, uh, just as today we see brands like Supreme promoting hype culture by making rare or limited run products uh, incredibly desirable to popular culture. So I think a really interesting modern reflection there of these specific desirable wine types and limited productivity. Now, although wine transcended social status in antiquity, it was drunk by the very poor and the very elite, uh, it's simultaneously embedded hierarchy. Uh, we've got different qualities that were almost certainly consigned to certain elite levels of society. Some of these would have simply been priced out uh, of accessing the more expensive wines. And we see great evidence of this in the Athenian Agora through various prices of imported wines. But also if we move slightly further west uh, to this fantastically well-preserved wine bar at Herculaneum in Italy, um, we see illustrated the different prices of four types of wine for sale. One of which, uh, as at the Athenian Agora, uh, was about the price of a full day's wage of a labourer. So um, quite expensive and, and clearly unaffordable to, to certain um, social strata. Now, the symposium and the later uh, convivium uh, in the Roman era provided the ideal place 
to show off one's access to high quality wines. Uh, this included using special containers, like you can see on the right here, um, designed to cool wine, uh, and for the very wealthy, uh, adding snow as an accessible form of ice. Uh, we do think that, that there was some play here between uh, using special containers uh, versus snow um, and some recognition of hygiene because we see these containers brought in uh, at a specific um, uh, date. Alternatively, people also heated their wine and used special mechanisms, at least in the Roman era, uh, to heat up their wine. Uh, this was considered quite a luxurious experience um, and, and we start to see specific uh, in, uh, mechanisms designed to do this. These social ceremonies also uh, began to overlap with religion. Uh, different gods would be invoked uh, and libations of wine poured for each bowlful uh, drunk. Uh, and we do start to see continuations of this through late antiquity and the Byzantine, uh, as I'll get to in a second. But how are they making this wine uh, through, through the early periods and into to the, the middle of our kind of discussion today? Uh, well, in the Bronze Age, as we saw on Crete, there were very early forms of treading systems that clearly existed, mostly on a small dispersed scale, uh, and undoubtedly many of these made from organic material that, that no longer survive archaeologically. We think there were a great many uh, wooden treading mechanisms and wooden treading basins scattered throughout the countryside. We see this uh, on painted ceramic, uh, and we just simply don't have the evidence of this anymore. And it's also possible that the method of simply laying grapes uh, in basins or, or in jars to let juices flow out and ferment naturally uh, with no added pressure also existed. Uh, we certainly know that this occurred by the classical and Roman periods and produced one of the highest quality wines. While in other regions, um, like you can see in the image on the right in, in France, uh, as well as in Italy and Turkey, we know that wine production often used huge uh, monumental lever presses uh, to press the grapes. It remains quite unclear as to the extent that this actually occurred in Greece, uh, especially in the classical and Hellenistic eras. Uh, it's entirely possible that the majority of wine uh, in these earlier periods of Greek history was made predominantly by treading grapes and archaeology starts to suggest this. Um, examples datable to these periods, you can see one on the left there um, of, a, of a Hellenistic winery uh, on Crete. Um, almost uh, always confirm this. We've got treading basins and treading floors and, and very little evidence of mechanical pressing, uh, especially at, at other sites like Mycenae and in Athens. However, much more research is required. Um, very little has been done in Greece, uh, as well as that integrating scientific components like uh, using geochemical analysis to really nail down what commodities were being produced uh, on presses found uh, in the archeological record. We have evidence from, from later contexts, um, like that here on Delos uh, from late antiquity, which clearly shows that lever pressing uh, using um, very large lever, wooden lever beams was used for wine production um, after uh, the classical Hellenistic uh, and early Roman periods. What is, in, what is clear that it's exceedingly rare, if ever, to depict a mechanical press on Greek pottery for wine production. It's almost always related to olive oil pressing. Once the, the grapes were pressed or trod, they would almost always flow into a large pithos or, or in later periods, a masonry or concrete vat. Uh, you can see in the archeology span here to collect uh, large amounts of must, um, undergo initial fermentation, uh, and then probably be transferred into smaller ceramic vessels like amphorae, uh, sealed with a ceramic or, or pitch uh, or cork stopper for se secondary fermentation uh, and also storage and aging. These amphorae would likely be uh, closed for, for, you know, six months or so, uh, perhaps longer, uh, unless pressure or foam buildup required intervention, uh, until a festival to celebrate the opening of the wine jars and tasting the new wine occurred, um, like the Anthesteria in Greece held in February uh, in honour of Dionysus in the classical era. Now, what happens when we move through the early Roman period in Greece and into late antiquity and Byzantine? Well, the, the, general, uh, the general conclusion is that there was no end to winemaking uh, as was traditionally thought in, in earlier scholarship. Um, traditionally, uh, researchers thought that desolation and abandonment in certain regions of Greece, like, like the Cyclades, led to uh, a decrease and loss of production in these regions. But now we know um, through the archeology span in particular, there was much greater continuity uh, than we previously suspected. Uh, and this also applies to winemaking, not just settlement through the late antique and into the Byzantine eras. 
Even when new cultures uh, or religions appeared and colonized, um, this does not necessarily mean that winemaking stopped or changed, uh, and this is certainly true in Greece too. Uh, a fantastic example that I came across recently uh, is actually on the island of Sicily from the 5th to the 11th century CE, uh, when despite a prominent Islamic period, uh, wine continued to be produced locally uh, and in fact exported from cities like Palermo and Sicily. Uh, merchants continued to capitalise uh, on profitable trade and produce of commodities like wine, um, which was stereotypically prohibited under Islamic rule showing that the relationship of wine production and consumption uh, during periods of quite dramatic um, change is far from straightforward. We can't just assume that these commodities stopped. Now, there were certainly changes after the, the High Roman Empire. As late as 691 CE, uh, we see a canon issue, issued uh, forbidding masked workers from shouting Dionysus as they trod grapes. Uh, instead, it was deemed that the, the phrase, Lord have mercy, was more appropriate, and this was, um, this was implemented in, the, in this, um, this late antique era. And we also see that winemaking and religion continued to be intertwined uh, at the pressing installations themselves. This one from Delos, which I'll zoom in on now, uh, the counterweight in particular from the wine press, uh, and another example from the island, really clearly illustrates this, this intertwined relationship between religion uh, and the production of wine, even through the, the early Christian period. We've got this beautiful uh, early Christian iconography on the counterweight itself, crosses, uh, vines across the top uh, and some animals. Uh, and on this example, a, a lovely inscribed phrase, Christ help your servant Peter. Uh, and to me, this, this raises wonderful questions uh, of who Peter is. Was, was he the winemaker? Was, was he the owner of the installation? Was, was he simply um, someone using the counterweight in its daily uh, activity? Uh, and another example um, from, from the island of Delos are, are these early Christian lamps, which show uh, aspects of the vintage people um, harvesting grapevines, um, continuing to show this beautiful relationship between winemaking and, and, and social culture and, and religious on, religion on the island. Now we know that uh, through the periods of late antiquity and the Byzantine uh, in Greece and the Aegean, um, there was a, a boom in rural agri agriculture and profitability uh, across the Eastern Mediterranean even more broadly, uh, and viticulture undoubtedly played a role in this. Again, reflected in the archaeology, this is seen through industrial uh, scale amphora production, uh, particularly on some of the Cycladic islands like Paros. You can see here a number of kilns dating to this era. And in fact, there are at least three more which have been uh, discovered since this map. So a real cluster uh, and hive of industrial ceramic amphora production, probably tied into what was a wine industry on the island or nearby uh, in the late antique and Byzantine era. Now, during these periods, much of the wine, uh, much of the land, sorry, was owned by monasteries who likely made uh, great quantities of wine for, for not only ritual use, but also to sell and contribute to the church economy. Uh, private individuals, peasants and small scale domestic production obviously uh, continued to a great extent too, um, but is much more difficult to see through the archaeological record uh, and the literature as well. A significant quantity uh, of this Greek wine was shipped to Constantinople, uh, to the capital, particularly from the Aegean Islands, uh, but also from regions like Thebes and the Peloponnese uh, through these later eras. And this was helped by the fact that monasteries at times were exempt from customs duties, uh, which led to a, a rather um, immense economic advantage over private producers. Uh, as you can see here, uh, those monasteries at Patmos and Mount Athos, uh, obviously highly successful and very, very wealthy, um, were making immense profits uh, selling things like wine to the capital. So this brings me to uh, the end of our discussion today as we moved through Greek history and viniculture. Um, and if we just very quickly fast forward to the modern era, uh, a lovely full circle moment where we look at this uh, modern winemaking equipment from the island of Paros. We see here that ancient practices in essence flowed all the way through to us today with remarkably little change. Um, these two images here are, are treading basins from just outside the city of Parikia. Um, and if you visit the Cyclades today, you'll see many of these scattered throughout the countryside. Um, they have almost identical architectural form to ancient examples um, from islands like nearby Delos. Uh, and I in fact met, met a lovely lady who, who owned this uh, example on the bottom, uh, in the bottom right. 
And she told me all about her small vineyard that she keeps at the back of her house, uh, the way she harvests the grapes um, grown in these basket-like bunches, uh, which we also see um, in the ancient literature, uh, and then how they tread grapes in, in these uh, pateri or, or treading basins each year. So I think it's a fascinating uh, and quite important case study of agricultural and vinicultural continuity and practice um, all the way from antiquity uh, to today uh, and is precisely where I'm going to leave this lecture. Thank you very much.